Well, hello and good Tuesday morning to you. I'm Scott Fisher, and this morning I'll be continuing to fill in for my good friend Don Preston in his morning musings. This is my musings of a Texas preacher man. Don's been recovering from strep throat for the past two months. His doctor has urged him to give his vocal cords a break, and he's asked me to step in for him again this week. I've been in the midst of a study of the new covenant the covenant established by Jesus, the promised Messiah of Israel, and Savior of the whole world. We've been seeing that the Old Testament prophecies of a coming Messiah, Messianic kingdom, and new covenant find their fulfillment in Jesus. In fact, as we've seen and will continue to see throughout this study, the text of the Old Testament serves as source material for Jesus and the New Testament writers. As I stated yesterday, I'm going back to a few of the messages I shared earlier in this series with my regular listeners about a month ago. I believe them to be so important to our topic and our study of the New Covenant that with so many new viewers through Don's Morning Musings, I wanted to make it available to you. Now, our text today is in Hebrews chapter 1. Of all the books in the New Testament, the book of Hebrews is the most focused on the contrast between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. For many years, it was attributed to the Apostle Paul as the author, but that is debatable, and it was probably written in 65 or 66 AD. I kind of lean toward Paul, but it doesn't really matter if it was or wasn't. The date it was written will become more and more important as we go through these next few days. Now, Hebrews chapter 1 is packed with statements that tie back to the Old Testament. So let's take a look, beginning at verse 1. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. Now the writer connects in the very first verses the writings of the prophets and the teachings of Jesus. His statement here is that God spoke to the fathers in the prophets, speaking of the Old Testament prophets, and he did so at many times in many different ways. But now, and this is now during the first century AD, in these last days, he has spoken to us in his son. Now, amazingly, because so many contemporary evangelical Christians believe we are living in, that we are living in the last days, They now apply this to us. But as we've seen in previous videos, it's vital to identify the pronouns. Who is the us of Hebrews chapter 1 verse 2? It was the audience being written to in the mid-60s AD, not us in the 21st century. Now to get around that, our contemporary futurist friends will say, well, We're living in the last of the last days. No, we're not. The last days were just prior to AD 70. And the end was the long prophesied end of the old covenant era with the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. Now the writer then begins to focus on Jesus, the son, the Messiah. God has now spoken to us through his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, he is the fulfillment of the promise made to Abraham and the fathers. And then it says, through whom also he made the world. Now, I mostly use the New American Standard Bible, and I exclusively use Logos Bible software. And you can see here that right before the word world is a three and an F. It, it, it's drop downs, the three and the F. The actual word used from the Greek is aeon, or literally ages. And in verse three, the writer continues on. And he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature. And he upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high having become as much better than the angels as he has inherited a more excellent name than they. This ties into what we saw in a previous video regarding the summing up 
of all things in Christ. Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact representation of his nature. He is God. He, he's the glory of God. And once his mission of the purification of sins was accomplished through the cross, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Now again, God is spirit. He doesn't have a literal, physical right hand. Is Jesus right now sitting on a literal, physical throne in heaven? No, it, it's, it's a metaphor. It's, it's a spiritual revelation. As Paul said to the Corinthians, we have known Christ after the flesh, but we know him thus no longer. He dwells among his people. He's in our midst. His kingdom is within us. And from verses 5 to 13, the writer quotes from several Old Testament texts and applies them to Christ. We're going to start with the first one in verse 5. And there's actually two in verse 5. For to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And again, the second one, I will be a father to him, and he will be a son to me. Now, this is incredibly important to grasp. Psalm 2 is a prophetic, messianic psalm that speaks of the Lord's anointed. In Psalm chapter 2, verses 6 and 7, it says, But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my, my holy mountain. I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son today. I have begotten you. And the writer of Hebrews is proclaiming that Jesus, through his crucifixion and resurrection and ascension, he is the fulfillment of this psalm. And the next quote is from 2 Samuel 7, 14. Now, I briefly discussed this in yesterday's video. If you haven't seen that video, I would encourage you to go back and watch it. This is the passage where David has the idea to build a house for God. And he mentions it to Nathan the prophet. David's at peace. He's conquered his enemies. He's living in a newly built, beautiful palace of cedar. And basically he says to Nathan, Nathan, here I am, king of Israel, victorious and at peace, living in this fine palace of cedar. And we've got God in a tent in the backyard. I need to build him a house. And Nathan, without consulting with God, says, David, that's a great idea. You should do it. Well, Nathan goes home and he has an encounter with God. And this story and its meaning gets twisted over time. But folks, this is the text of the encounter. Pay close attention because what we're about to read, honestly, I doubt many of you have ever heard before. Let's pick up the story in 2 Samuel chapter 7, beginning at verse 4. But in the same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan saying, Go and say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord, are you the one who should build me a house to dwell in? For I have not dwelt in a house since the day I brought up the sons of Israel from Egypt, even to this day. But I've been moving about in a tent, even in a tabernacle. Wherever I have gone with all the sons of Israel, did I speak a word with one of the tribes of Israel, which I commanded to shepherd my people, Israel, saying, why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now, I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound to me like God was too interested in having a house built for him by David or by anyone else for that matter. He never asked for it. Now we continue in verse eight. Now, therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following sheep to be a ruler over my people Israel, 
I've been with you wherever you've gone and have cut off all your enemies from before you, and I will make you a great name like the names of the great men who are on the earth. I will also appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them that they may live in their own place and not be disturbed again, nor will the wicked afflict them any more as formerly, even from the day that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel. And I will give you rest from all your enemies. The Lord also declares to you that the Lord will make a house for you. When your days are complete and you lie down with your fathers, I'll raise up your descendant, your seed after you, who will come forth from you and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be a father to him and he will be a son to me. Now that's the part that the writer of Hebrews quotes. And when he commits iniquity, I'll correct him with the rod of men and the strokes of the sons of men. But my loving kindness shall not depart from him as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed before you. Your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever. Now the writer of Hebrews quotes 2 Samuel 7, 14, and he applies it to Jesus. Here's the problem. Most read 2 Samuel 7 and look at it as God not allowing David to build the temple, but says it will be Solomon, his son, who will build the temple. But that's not what it says. If this is a prophetic, messianic text speaking of Jesus, and it is, then what God is saying to David is, you're not going to build a house for me. I'm going to build the house for you and will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Obviously, not Solomon, but Jesus. The messianic kingdom, the messianic temple not built with hands, but living stones. That is the only legitimate interpretation of the text. Well, we'll conclude today's study with that, but tomorrow we're going to pick it up right here. I hope you're finding our study to be challenging and encouraging. Don's been mentioning a special sale throughout the month of August of 2021. If you order over $25, he'll give a 15% discount and free shipping for U.S. orders only. You can go to his website at donkpreston.com or bibleprophecy.com. Last week, I mentioned and recommended four books that Don has written, all of which have had a huge impact on my life and my understanding of Scripture. We shall meet him in the air, the wedding of the King of Kings, like Father, like Son on clouds of glory, circumcision in the new creation with a question mark, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. A study of 2 Peter chapter 3. Now, I highly recommend each one of them. Yesterday, I introduced you to the first in a three-volume series titled Torah to Tell Us. The first volume is entitled The End of the Law, The Passing of the Law of Moses. Today, I want to introduce you to volume two of Torah to Tell Us, and that is the resurrection of Daniel, chapter 12, verse 2, fulfilled or future. Now, if you want to go into depth, in the study of the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, these books and the entire three-volume series will be a great companion in your study. Now again, here's the deal. Order $25 online and receive a 15% discount and free shipping. I invite you to join me on Musings of a Texas Preacher Man. I post a teaching four times each week on Monday through Thursday. I'll post a link on Facebook and Twitter and if you click the subscribe button in the lower right corner of your screen, you'll be notified whenever I post a new video. If you like these videos, I hope you'll click the like button and even share it with your friends on social media. Now remember, let Scripture interpret Scripture. I hope you go out and make today a great day. 
Have a safe and blessed day, and I'll look forward to seeing you right here again.